our study of fluid mechanics by looking at fluids at rest. And we call that fluid statics. And to begin, we should define what a fluid is. We say that it's, it's a system of particles that's held together by weak forces of interactions and the walls of some container. Okay, so in AP physics, at the high school level, we will say that liquids and gases are both considered fluids. And so in this lesson, we're going to investigate pressure, density, depth, and the buoyant force. So let's begin with pressure. The pressure that's in a fluid has a lot to do with force. In general, whenever an object is submerged, or partially submerged, the fluid acts in a manner to compress the object. So this is to say that the fluid exerts a force on the object that's perpendicular to each surface of the object. And we define pressure as force per unit area. So the force that's acting per the unit area of that surface is equal to the pressure. Okay, Pressure is measured in units of newtons per meter squared and that has a derived SI unit called the Pascal which we give the symbol PA, capital PA. So here a large rectangular fish tank is resting on the floor and it's filled with water. The tank's two meters long, one meter wide, and one meter deep. And we want to find the pressure that's exerted by the tank on the floor. So here's our tank. And what we can say first is, okay, well, let's find the volume of this tank. And it's rectangular, so it's length times width times height. And we get 2.00 meters cubed when we multiply 2 times 1 times 1. Next, we want to say is, okay, well, let's find the mass of the water that's going to fill this tank. And we're going to assume that the mass of the tank in comparison to the mass of the water is small. So we're not going to worry about the mass of the acrylic walls of the tank. We're just going to find the mass of the water that goes in it. And, of course, mass is equal to density times volume. And if you need a review, density is measured always in, in, in mass per, per unit volume. And so here, most, most densities you can find in, in a textbook or most densities you can find in um, online are measured in kilograms per meter cubed. And so here we can find the mass of the water because we can look up the density of water. And we can see, okay, it's 1.00 times 10 to the third or 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And so when we multiply that by the volume, we find that, hey, in this fish tank, we have 2,000 kilograms of water. And once we've done this, we can say, okay, well, let's find the force of gravity that's acting on this volume of water, on this mass of water. And of course, the force of gravity is equal to mass times g, which is the acceleration due to gravity. We can find out that this is a lot of newtons of force that is pulling this down and it's 19,600 newtons of force um, that's acting on the water in the tank. And we can convert that then into a pressure. We can say, okay, well let's find the pressure and we know that we've defined pressure as being force per unit area. So you have to say, okay, before we can go any further, what is the area over which this force is distributed? And, of course, if gravity is acting down, this force is distributed over the area of the bottom of the tank. So it's two meters long and one meter wide, and that's the rectangular area over which the force is acting. So the area of the bottom of the tank is two times one meters, which is 2.0 meters squared. We can say, okay, well then the pressure is equal to the force, which was 19,600, and we divide by the area of the bottom of the tank, which is 2 meters squared. And the pressure that we get is 9,800 pascals, or 9.8 times 10 to the third pascals. Most of you that are watching this have probably um, experienced how pressure varies with depth. So you've certainly experienced this if you've ever tried to 
get something that has sunk to the bottom of the swimming pool and you you swim down to try and get this object that's on the bottom of the tank and you can feel um, the pressure changing as you go deeper and deeper and deeper and really what happens is you can feel it in your ears you can feel it in your um, in your head sometimes you can feel it in your chest and it's really this kind of feeling of being compressed also, you may have been on a long drive and you've been going up a long steep hill and you you experience your ears pop as you've as you've driven up this long steep hill. Really what we'll do now is we're going to investigate how pressure varies with depth and see what's going on in these phenomena. So to begin, let's consider a jar of fluid with some density rho open to the air. Okay, so it's a jar of fluid and it's got some density and it's open to the air. Within this jar of fluid, let's select a small sample. And so you can see that, okay, in our diagram to the left of, of uh, excuse me, to the right, we have indicated a smaller cylinder inside of the large jar. Okay, so that's our sample of fluid. And it's going to run from the top surface to some depth of, of H. Okay, the cross-sectional area of the sample, the top and the bottom, is A. We're just going to call the area A. So, the pressure exerted at the bottom of this sample comes from the fluid. And we're going to call that P. Okay, the pressure that's exerted on the top comes from the atmospheric pressure. And we call that P naught. Okay, so let's analyze the forces that are acting on this sample of water. So we have the force from the liquid at the bottom, which is the pressure at the bottom times the area. And that's acting in the upwards direction, so we give it an, a positive. We've got the pressure excuse me, the force that's acting from the atmospheric pressure, that's pushing down, so we give it a negative, and that's P-naught times A. And then we've got the force of gravity that's acting on this sample, which is the mass of the fluid times G. Of course, nothing's moving, so this doesn't have any, any acceleration, and so really, we for Newton's law in this case, we just write equals zero, because this is a case where nothing's moving. But we can say, okay, well, let's take a closer look at what the mass of this sample is. Well, we know that mass is equal to density times volume, and what's the volume of this? Well, it's equal to the cross-sectional area times the height. And we don't need to get into um, defining what that cross-sectional area is. We know that for a cylinder it's pi r squared, but that doesn't really matter. We're just going to leave it as A. And so we can now replace mass with this small equation, including density and depth. We can say, oh, okay, well, then we've got pressure times area minus the atmospheric pressure times area minus rho times the depth times G times area is equal to zero. And we notice right away all of the areas cancel out and we can rearrange. And we get that pressure at some depth h is equal to the atmospheric pressure plus the density of the fluid times g times the depth. And this is really the pressure that exists at some depth h below the surface of, of a liquid that's open to the atmosphere. Standard atmospheric temperature, so excuse me, standard atmospheric pressure is usually taken to be 1.00 atm, which is 1.013 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And um, it's usually thought of as a constant, and for the problems that we're going to do, you can consider it a constant. So here's an example. Find the force that's exerted on your eardrum which has an approximate cross-sectional area of one centimeter squared due to the water above when you're swimming at the bottom of a pool 5.0 meters deep. So here's what we know 
We know that the depth is going to be 5 meters. We know that the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. We know that the atmospheric pressure is a constant. It's 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And we know that the cross-sectional area of your eardrum is about 1 centimeter squared. And if we convert that into meters squared, we have 1 times 10 to the minus fourth meters squared. So our first step is to say, OK, here's our equation for pr how pressure varies with depth. And we can sub in some of the numbers that we now know. And we find, OK, the pressure at that depth that's acting on your eardrum is 1.503 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And we know, if we rearrange our pressure formula, pressure equals force over area, that force is equal to pressure times area. And so we'll take the pressure that we just found and multiply by the cross-sectional area of your eardrum, and we come up with about 15 newtons, which for your eardrum is a lot of force. Um, your eardrum is a very, very small membrane. And so this was, is why it can be quite painful when you dive down and why you really can feel it in your ears. So we just derived an expression above. Pressure at some point in the liquid depends on the depth. But it also depends on the surface pressure. So if really, the, past, the last example looked at, hey, let's try and change the depth and see what pressure we get. But also, the surface pressure doesn't necessarily have to be just atmospheric pressure. It can be anything. And as we change that surface pressure, we can have an immediate on effect on the, on the pressure at any, any point in the liquid. And this was observed by a French scientist, Blaise Pascal, and is now called Pascal's Law. Okay, and that's that if you change the surface pressure, you're going to change the pressure throughout the fluid. One interesting application of Pascal's Law is the notion of hydraulic lifts, and there's a little diagram of it here. But here, when we change the pressure due to some force F1 over a cross-sectional area A1, that force must be, that pressure that we create there, that surface pressure, is distributed throughout the entire fluid. In other words, it's a constant. The pressure that we create by applying a force F1 is now, that pressure is constant in the whole entire fluid. And it will then give rise to some force F2 at cross-sectional area A2. And so what we can write then is we can write, okay, well, if the pressure in the fluid is constant, then F1 over A1 is equal to F2 over A2. And we can rearrange this, and we can say, okay, well, then the force that's delivered at the second spot is equal to the ratio of the cross-sectional areas times the initial force that I delivered. And you can notice that if the second cross-sectional area is much larger than the first cross-sectional area, what I can do is I can really multiply my force so that I can push down with F1 and have it be a tiny little force, and I can create a very, very large force, F2, and this is how hydraulic lifts work we can see that F2 is greater than F1 by this factor of A2 over A1, and we call that the force multiplying factor. And really, um, if we want to take this one step further, we can look at the volume that's pushed down on the left of the diagram is actually and has to be the same as the volume that's pushed up on the right. So this is the consequence. The volume on the left is A1, D1. It's the cross-sectional area times the distance that we had to push down. And that's equal to A2, D2, which is on the right. And so what we end up with is this is kind of more of an inverse relationship. This is the trade-off. If we want to get this force multiplying happening, piston 1, which has a small cross-sectional area and a small force, must be displaced by a proportionally larger distance than piston 2. And that's okay. 
we can make that piston as big as we want, but this is the notion, this is how hydraulic lifts work. They work through this principle of pressure. So here's an example of this. A car lift used at a car at a service station employs compressed air. It creates a force on a small piston with a radius of 5 centimeters. The pressure is transmitted hydraulically through a fluid to another piston with a radius of 15 centimeters. What force and pressure must the compressed air exert to lift a car with a weight of 13,300 newtons? So, this is what we want to do. We know that our R1, which is our small piston, has a radius of 0 0.05 meters. And the big piston has a radius of 0 0.15 meters. We know that the big force, F2, is 13,300 newtons. So what's F1? That's what we want to find. So first of all, let's find the cross-sectional areas for each of these. We can say area 1 is equal to pi times R1 squared. And area 2 is equal to pi times R2 squared. We see the difference. It's almost 10 times different. And so now we'll sub into our force multiplying formula and rearrange to find that the force that we must push down with is about 1,477 newtons. Which is a lot less than having to lift a car of weight 13,300 newtons. It's a lot less. So what pressure must that compressed air be at in order to move that piston? Well, pressure 1 is equal to force 1 over cross-sectional area 1. And we get 1.9 times 10 to the fifth pascals, which is not that far off. It's about twice atmospheric pressure, which is reasonable for compressed air. OK. So let's look now at Archimedes' principle. And if you've ever been, again, in a swimming pool and you've tried to hold a beach ball under the surface of the water, it's actually it's very difficult to do. Um, the large, the, basically, the water provides this huge upward force to the ball. And if you ever let it go, it, it's almost like the water is pushing the ball out and, and you can actually see it go um, splash up in the air. And this force is known as the buoyant force, and it's described by the following principle. The magnitude of the buoyant force always equals the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. Okay, so this is known as Archimedes' principle, and this buoyant force is a new force that we introduce, and basically what we're saying here is that whenever you submerge an object in a liquid, the force that's applied to that object is equal to the weight of the fluid that's been displaced by that object. And so with a beach ball, it has a very large um, volume. And so the mass of water that that beach ball would take up is quite large. And it's, it's certainly much larger to the weight that the beach ball has when it's filled with air. But we're getting beyond ourselves. This principle has a lot to say about the nature of objects that are submerged in fluids. So here's a few observations. Observation number one. Archimedes' principle does not refer to the makeup of the object experiencing the buoyant force. So that means that if you put a, a cube of wood and a cube of steel that both have the same size into, into some fluid, they both experience the same buoyant force. And this is a very interesting observation because the object's composition plays no role. The buoyant force is a function of the fluid, not of the object, not of the composition of the object that's being submerged. So really that makes us ask, okay, well then where does this force come from? Well, we know it has something to do with the fluid. So we can say the buoyant force exists because of the difference in pressure at the top of the object and at the bottom of the object. And we know that that difference in pressure, because we just derived it, is equal to rho g times h, which is the depth. So that's really where the force comes from. It comes from the difference in pressure at the top of the object, 
and the bottom of the object. And if we take this piece by piece, we can say, okay, well, the buoyant force is equal to the pressure times the cross-sectional area on any surface. So I've just replaced the F with now a very specific force, the buoyant force. And we can include rho GH, but we know that the depth times the cross-sectional area for anything is equal to the volume. And so I get an expression for the buoyant force. It's equal to the density of the fluid times G times the volume of the object. Um, and this is very interesting, and we're going to see how to use these. Before we go on, um, Archimedes, very, very famous Greek mathematician, probably one of the most famous scientists um, in the early area, in the early era, excuse me. He was the first to accurately measure pi. He was a genius inventor. Um, the Archimedes screw is, is an inclined rotating tube that is used to lift water from the holds of ships. They still use it today. He invented the catapult. He created systems of levers, pulleys, and weights for lifting heavy loads. This guy was a genius. And uh, we owe all of this stuff to him. So another couple notes. Okay, so what about totally submerged objects? What about objects that are completely underwater? We can say, okay, well, for any object that's totally submerged, that means the entire volume of the object is underwater. The buoyant force, then, is equal to the density of the fluid times the volume of the object times g. And we kind of already mentioned that a little bit. And this is in, um, this is different than objects that are floating. Because when you think about something that's totally submerged and you think about something that's floating, an object that's totally submerged, the entire volume of the object is below the surface of the water. When something's floating, only part of the object is below the surface of the water. And so here, the object's only partially submerged. So V0 is the volume of the object, VO, and VF is the volume of the fluid that's displaced. It's important to note that VF, yes, it's the volume of fluid displaced, but it's also the volume of the object that's below the surface. And so the buoyant force then would equal um, just the amount, it would equal basically the volume of water that's displaced, VF, times the density of the fluid. We know that the force of gravity would be the mass of the object times g, which is the acceleration due to gravity. And we can, of course, replace mass of the object with the density of the object times the volume of the object. And hey, it's floating, so it's not accelerating. So we know that these two forces balance, the buoyant force and the gravitational force. And so we get this little expression once we cancel out the g's is that when something's floating, the density of the fluid times the volume of the fluid that's been displaced is equal to the density of the object times the volume of the object. And one final example, a styrofoam slab has a thickness of 10 centimeters and a density of 300 kilograms per meter cubed. When a 75 kilogram swimmer is resting on it, the slab floats in fresh water with its top at the same level as the water's surface. Find the area, the cross-sectional area of the slab. So first of all, this is what we're given. We're given that the density of the object is 300 kilograms per meter cubed, and it has a thickness T of 0 0.1 meters. So here's our slab, and here's a free body diagram of the slab. So it's resting just below the water. So what we're going to say is, it's basically totally submerged. Okay, it's totally submerged in water, but it's just it's just under the water's surface. So we've got a buoyant force pushing us up, and we've got the force of gravity that's acting on the styrofoam itself, Fg, that's pulling down, and we've got the force of gravity from the swimmer, and that's going down as well. And so it's totally submerged, but it's floating, which means it's not moving. It's not accelerating up or down. And so we can take the sum of the forces in the up and down direction, the y direction, to be equal to zero. And what we have is we have the buoyant force in the upwards direction. We've got the 
swimmer in the down direction and the force of the gravity in the down direction as well. And we can now replace these with what we know. Well, the buoyant force is going to equal the mass of the swimmer times gravity plus the mass of the object times gravity. And what do we know for an object that's totally submerged? The buoyant force is equal to the density of the um, fluid times the volume of the object that's been displaced times g. And right away we can see that all of our g's are going to cancel out. But now we can say, okay, well, I'm getting close because I want to find the area of the slab. And right now I've got the volume of the slab. I've got an expression for the volume of the slab, which is good. But what we want to do now is say, okay, well now we really need to put piece everything together because we have this, the mat, we're never told the mass, M naught, the mass of the slab of styrofoam. But that doesn't matter because we have the density of it and we're trying to find the volume of it anyway. So we can replace mass, M naught, by rho naught, V naught. Rearrange and simplify and we get that the volume of the slab is equal to 75 divided by density of the water minus the density of the styrofoam which comes out to 75 over 700 and hey there's the density excuse me the volume of the styrofoam slab well we know the thickness of it so finding the area is just really one step away area times the thickness and we can find the area the cross-sectional area of the slab of styrofoam is 1.07 meters squared.